tonight. Um, we appreciate your support in getting the information. Um, Ms. Yomek, as the 8th grade counselor, has met with the 8th grade students, and what we want is to be sure that you have the same information before for selection sheets for ninth grade need to be turned into the guidance office, because we really want you and your children to be having a discussion um, because we're going to emphasize doing four-year planning. And that's really the focus of tonight, is not just to talk about the coursework for ninth grade, but to think about the next four years, because there are these wonderful things called prerequisites, um, which mean that you have to back everything up. In order to be eligible to take something senior year, you have to have taken this junior year, and so on and so forth. So we really look at this as a four-year, the beginning of a four-year plan. And that's when we appreciate you coming tonight and spending the time. There is a lot of information. Um, and as you go home and you look at the materials, if there's something that you know, isn't clear or that you said, did they really say that, um, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Um, we want to answer your questions. Um, unlike teachers who have difficulty you know, taking phone calls during the day, um, if you don't reach us right at that moment, we can call you back if you leave a message. And so we really you know, want to have that um, relationship with you. So please don't hesitate. Um, that being said, um, high school is a little bit different in terms of how we as counselors work with students. Um, as Mr. Modesto said, I have the seventh grade class, and Ms. Yeoman takes the eighth grade class because um, the teachers have the same meeting time. So we can't uh, both be, we, we need two of us at least to be meeting with the teachers uh, separately. In high school, we work with students by the last name, by letter of the alphabet. And the reason for that is we want to stay with your student for four years. So that by the time we get to senior year and we're writing letters of recommendation, we know your students very well. Um, now, um, I have had the very end of the alphabet. Um, Ms. Yomek has had the middle, and Ms. Neal has had the beginning. Um, there will be a, a new guidance counselor next year. We do have someone retiring. We don't know who that will be, but the plan is still to stay with students for four years. Um, some schools cycle and, and focus on certain years. We find that um, it's better in terms of writing letters of recommendation to stay with them. What we hope to cover tonight um, are frontier graduation requirements. We want you to see how that compares to college admission requirements. We want to talk about credits because that's a new concept, different from middle school. Um, we want to talk about attendance, course levels, grade point averages. We want to talk about the course sequences by department, what I was alluding to before, what you need to take. Um, you know, junior year in order to be prepared for certain coursework in terms of the prerequisite senior year, and we'll break that down by department. We'll show sample high school schedules. Um, we'll have, obviously um, talk about any some of our special programs, um, like dual enrollment and those sorts of things, and then do a question and answer period. If there's something that you want to ask before we move on, just sort of shout out, let, let us know that you have a question. We're happy to take those in between as well. Okay, four-year plan. One of the pieces of paper that you had um, looks um, at the four years. And uh, as we go through departments, you'll see why it makes sense um, to look at things with this perspective. Now, that's not to say things will change. Your child may say that they love math right now. That's their favorite subject, and they want to take every math class that is offered at Frontier at the high school level. And then maybe they get to Honors Algebra 2 and they say, oh, I'm not quite as fond of this as I used to be. Um, and so it's not that they're locked in by looking at a four-year plan. But what we don't want to happen is for them not to think ahead and then find that they don't have the prerequisites to do something. So we'd rather have them think about it and then step off of a path than find that they never got on it and can't get to where they want to go. And, and so that's really the beauty of looking at it and talking about it from a four-year perspective. Not that it's set in stone and we're locking them into it. 
Um, so, when we look at classes, the overarching message that I want you to come away from is that Frontier prepares the students to go on. Now, the vast majority of our students go on for additional schooling immediately after. But some students who do not go a year later, they may go five years later, the beauty is that no matter when they decide they want to go, when they leave Frontier, they have the background necessary. Um, we require four social studies classes. We require, and we'll, as we get to the department, we'll talk about the sequencing. Colleges typically require two. Uh, we require four courses of English, so do colleges. We require math every year. Colleges want math every year, at least four courses. Um, when you're going to a four-year school right away, they want you to have gotten at least through pre-calc as a minimum. Um, we require four years of science. They require three. Um, again, four-year schools, what we're going to tell you is they want you to have had at least biology, chemistry, and physics, typically, if you're going to a four-year school. World language. We require two courses in the same foreign language to graduate. If you're applying in the Mass State system, they look for a minimum of two courses in the same language. <coughs> we do say to students, if you're considering going on to four-year schools, non-state schools, many of them prefer at least three years. If you're going to major in a language or anything with the word international in it, international finance or business, you want to take all four years of the same language at the high school level. We require 10 credits in physical education. We require two and a half in the arts, and we define arts very broadly. It's art as you might think of it. It's music. It's theater. It's woodshop. It, are, it includes classes in the career technology department, or some computer classes, that are more related to art. So it's a pretty broad spectrum. We require five credits in health. Um, and then other electives, students must have 140 credits to graduate. They also obviously need to pass the state requirements. Currently, for students, MPASS, probably down the road, some combination with PARC. But right now, for graduates, um, we're graduating at this moment, it's still the MPASS. Um, students are earning credit, unlike what they did in middle school. Um, that's how high school transcripts work. That's what colleges are looking at. How many credits did you earn in certain academic departments? Credits are earned by getting a passing grade, which is a 60, a D minus, or better. Um, all high school students in our school take 20 credits each semester, so 40 credits a year. They have the potential four years of earning 160 credits, they need 140 to graduate. So there's a little wiggle. Most students graduate with one. Um, a little hard. Okay, so this is how your student's day has looked for the last two years. They're with their team of teachers, their core teachers, social studies, science, math, and English, for 75% of the day. They're either with them first thing in the morning until exploratories begin at the end of the day, or on opposite days, they start with exploratories, and then they're with that team of teachers for the other 75%. And those exploratory teachers are what we call shared staff. They are teachers who, for the other 75% of the day, are teaching high school students. There are art teachers, our phys ed teachers, our health teachers, our computer technology teachers. And then for 25% of the day, during this exploratory time, they're working with middle school students. In the high school, um, we work by blocks. We are what, are, what is called a long block school. 
Um, when I was in school, um, classes were 45 minutes long, there were seven a day, and they lasted for the year. And about 15 years ago, schools looked at um, time on learning. And they looked at the fact that when you have passing time seven times a day, and you have teachers having to take attendance seven times a day, and you have startup time seven times a day, and wind down time as you're getting students at their assignments and out the door, there's a lot of time lost in terms of learning. So schools, at that point, numbers of them went to what are called long block schedule. And that means that instead of having 45 minute classes, you have four blocks that are about 85 minutes long. So you don't have the continual startup stopping and passing time like you do in a different schedule. And so we have four blocks each semester. If you're in a class that meets every day, your typical science, social studies, math, English, world language class, you are in five credits, you go to that class every day for about 85 minutes. We also have classes that meet every other day for the semester. Things like phys ed, health, most of our art classes, music classes. And so they meet the 85 minutes, but every other day. And then there's another every other day class that matches up with that. So that could be a phys ed health, it could be um, an art or band, um, whatever it happens to be. And um, that's how the schedule works each semester. Students complete a class in one half of the year. So the class either goes from August when we start school to mid-January when the first semester ends, or it goes from that January start date till the end of school, depending on how many starters we have. <laughs> Um, and because students are earning credit in high school, um, attendance counts. Uh, no credit is given if you're absent more than 10 times in a semester for an everyday class and more than five times in a class that meets every other day. So um, it's important um, to plan those things in. Obviously, if a student is significantly sick with a doctor's note, um, that those medical notes are typically waived. Um, court visits. I'm trying to think of other exceptions. Um, the other thing that seniors, um, if students visit a college and they work with their guidance counselor and they bring back verification for a visit, that can be an excused absence. What's not included our vacation that you take during the school year, um, or you know those occasional sick days where you don't go to a doctor. But um, as long as it doesn't go over 10 in a semester for an everyday class or five for an every other day, you're all set. Yes. And the only thing to emphasize on that is that we have excused and unexcused, which gets very confusing. A student, you could call in your child and they'd be excused, but it still counts as one of the 10. A parent's excuse, you get 10 days to excuse your child from school. Your child's not allowed to miss more than that. So sometimes you're like, well, I said they could be out low. Unfortunately, I have some parents that would let their child miss 25 days of school, and that doesn't work. So we cut the day, and if obviously, um, there's an appeals process, if there's something tragic happening or that kind of thing, um, it comes to me and we, we work out a, a system to uh, get credit. So it's not a, it's not a punitive system, um, it's just, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the, day, that's the number that's set, it's pretty standard across the board. Um, Nancy Omex and I are gonna go back and forth so she don't get sick voices I mean we can give you a break so okay. um, the next few slides are a little bit of information about course levels because this is another thing that changes when they get to the ninth grade and those of you that have been to twelfth grade twelfth graders know this that we start to um, accumulate credit and um, grades have a numerical value and that, that is what's called a grade point average or GPA. So um, all the courses in the high school have a level, and we'll see in this next slide what these levels correspond to. So a level zero are courses like PE, TSD is actually a structured study hall or a skills lab. Um, level one are our standard college prep classes. Level two would relate to our honors classes or any classes that have an X designation after them. And then the level three are the AP courses. 
chosen by the, the AP denominations that chosen by the teacher the year before or how does that um, work? The, they have gotten today, they all received their choice sheets, mm -hmm. um, upperclassmen. Um, so on that choice sheet there's a place for the AP teacher to sign off. Okay. So we've instructed the students to go to the advanced placement teacher and if, and they will have a conversation with them about what kind of student are you? Mm -hmm. Do you like English and in, in most cases, pretty good choices are made. Sometimes, if not, we, we will rectify that during the drop period. So, um, that's the point of that is to get them to the teacher who's actually teaching the class. And in all cases, um, here, the, the AP courses require some summer work. So that's usually a pretty good indicator whether the student's ready for advanced placement. Just to emphasize, you do not have to take anything prior to AP in order to take it. Mm -hmm. If you, you want to challenge yourself that year and someone blooms late and they say, you know what, it's junior year and I want to prove I want to go to a four-year college and I'm going to take a tougher load, We're, you know, we may say, hey, you know, you haven't shown in the past, and they say, I want to do it, we let them do it, yeah. you know, and so, so it's, it's, you know, 
Sometimes they don't follow, and sometimes they do well, and sometimes they don't. so hard with that material that they might benefit from revisiting algebra um, in ninth grade. Some students who did the, the 80 percent or so that did regular math, some of them, they just seem to sort of take off somewhere about this time in eighth grade. And even though they um, may have struggled previously, it sort of clicked developmentally. Um, it's, it, and math is really abstract, and, and really we, we've noticed that it just comes in in different places. And so the teacher may say, you know, you've just been whizzing through this. I believe you should start high school with a one semester algebra class, get back on that fast track. Other students may have taken more time, have had to do those fix ups, those retakes in regular math in middle school, and the teacher may say, you may benefit by taking algebra over a slower pace, doing 10 credits, doing half of the algebra first semester, algebra 1A, and half of the algebra second semester, algebra 1B. Um, and then there are a few students that really have not been successful with pre-algebra, they've really struggled through regular track, and the teacher may say, I think we need to revisit pre-algebra. So I'm going to recommend that you start in fundamentals of math. Everybody with me so far. So we we're really talking about five or so different possibilities, and, and that's why it gets so complicated. But we found that math needs require that level of diversity, because that is the, the subject area where there is the greatest level of diversity in terms of student learning. So we're, we're pleased to be able to offer the different paces and the different starting places. And you know, some students jump on and off. As I said earlier, some people start as high flyers and then as they get into the more in-depth material, they say, no, I don't want to take every AP class in math that you have to offer. I, you know, I really thought I did, but I no longer want to be an engineer. I, you know, I'm much more interested in X. So, um, so the math teacher in eighth grade will give recommendations to Ms. Yomek as the eighth grade counselor. Um, she, the math teacher, shares that information. I, I say, right now, I do 
have those, so if anybody would like to know what your child's been recommended for, um, you can email or call me. Um, also, the students have all been instructed to speak to the teachers during this last week. And they have the yellow sheets, the yellow, same yellow sheet that you all have. Um, so hopefully that's all taken care of by the time we have this Now, you know, you may not agree, and you're welcome to call and have a discussion with Ms. Yoga, but I will tell you that our math teachers have a very good track record. They know how many retakes, they know where your children have struggled and where what things have been easy for them. They have a very good track record in terms of their recommendations. But if you don't agree, as I said, you can always call and have a discussion. From here on in, and, and the reason why you have that sheet with sort of the different paths is because where you start then determines what you take sophomore year, what you take junior year, and what you take senior year. Again, back to that four-year planning. So we have two AP classes. Our AP math classes are year-long classes. In order to do, and I'm just going to say, AP statistics senior year, if you want to take every math class level that we have, and AP calculus, say, junior year, then the prerequisite for AP Calculus junior year is that you've done pre-calculus by the end of sophomore year. In order to take pre-calculus, you have to have taken Algebra 2. So you've really got to work your way backwards. Now some students, they're worse nightmares thinking about getting through the entire math curriculum. And we know that, and there's no right or wrong to this. It's what your child enjoys, what they excel at, where they struggle and taking that into account. It's not a one-size-fits-all when you get to this. And as I said, math is probably the most diverse department in terms of um, offerings to meet student needs. Okay. Yes? So, um, schedule, um, the teachers know the sequencing of the courses. Um, and some students, if they're, if they're struggling, will do, say, fundamentals and 1A, if, if they're really, really struggling in math. So they'll have fundamentals in the fall and 1A in the spring. 1A is a spring class. Um, and then if, say they didn't need the fundamentals, but they need the two semester algebra one. Then they're going to do algebra one in the spring. They're going to do algebra uh, one A in the spring. They're going to do algebra one B in the fall of their sophomore year. And they're going to do geometry. We're going to tell them they have to take two math sophomore year before they take the math MCAS because we want them to have had the geometry and the algebra most recently before they take that test. Okay. Now, some kids, as I said, will have come in. They've all, they will have already done Algebra 1 in, um, by the time they completed 8th grade. They may start in Geometry, and if they're really good at math, they'll start at Geometry X, the honors level, and they'll do that. And that class could fall in the fall. It could fall in the spring. They'll then typically do Algebra 2 X if they're at the honors level, and pre-calculus, the two classes to position themselves. So where they double up is sophomore year, unless they really need to revisit the pre-algebra. Like can, can they take that second course in ninth grade if they were in advanced math in eighth grade? They can only go as far as geometry And then the in second And then the so second really semester there's no math. what they did in middle school. Sorry. Mm -hmm. To go back to your question, that is the weakness in block scheduling, is there is, there can be gap periods in when you take things. For example, you could take Spanish 1 freshman year, for some reason you don't want to take Spanish 2 sophomore year, and end up taking it your junior year, and then you have that gap. The same thing, I mean, I think foreign language and math are the two, two courses that, I mean, the two subject areas where you, you're going to have, you will have slippage. And just like we have slippage over the summer, um, you know, we will we'll have slippage for freshmen who don't take the math the first semester. Um, and our job is to get them up to full speed by the end of the sophomore year. And the reason why we, we made some changes recently to that is that you know, we were, we're doing very well on the MCAS testing, but now we're starting to see a slipping in, 
SAT scores because they're taking so many maths early and not maths later on. And so it's like, you, you gotta give somewhere within that, so we're trying to find the best match within that, and that's what we have up there. So, so if you are a second semester Algebra 1A teacher, you're doing a lot of review, and you probably have a frustrating first few weeks to get kids up to speed. So, it is it is the fact of the schedule. Just regular geometry, not an option? Yes, so <coughs> geometry or honors geometry. geometry. The X in ninth grade. In ninth grade. You, you can do regular geometry in ninth grade. But it's not on the it's schedule not here for ninth um, grade. It most students who have done, though, the algebra, the honors level work, typically go into algebra, I'm sorry, honors geometry. So in other words, um, we have very, so the geometry typically, the regular level, are typically those students who have done algebra over the year. So they've done the first half in the spring of their freshman year. They do the second half in fall of their sophomore year. And then they're doing regular geometry in the spring of their sophomore year. Necessary to graduate, they, maybe they only wanted to go as far as pre-calc. They didn't want to do advanced math. They weren't thinking about going into math, the science, engineering. Math wasn't their favorite subject, and they finished. And so, as Mr. Modesto said, um, a lot of students um, stopped taking math. You could conceivably have done that at the end of sophomore year, um, and then you go to take your ACTs, your SATs or your placement test, the Accuplacer test at state colleges, and you're not doing as well. We did fine on the MCAS in a lot of cases at the advanced level, but now it's been a year or two since you've had math. And we forget math. Um, we use for our writing and our reading skills every day. Uh, but if we don't have math, we don't necessarily do it. And so the state of math said, if you want to apply to a math state school, you need to have math every year. And so that's what some of these other offerings are. For people that don't want to do honors calculus, AP work, but they need classes junior and senior year, um, things like elementary probability and statistics, um, advanced topics in algebra, things of that nature. And again, it's it's a matter of making those decisions as you see how you do in your ninth and 10th grade now. But it's important to know that if you want to preserve the option currently of applying to a mass state school, 
you need to have them out Social studies. Um, all grade nine students take world history. They do need to make a choice on their sheet ahead of time. Unlike English, where Ms. Um, Ziomik said you don't make the decision until um, you arrive in your English class in ninth grade. In social studies, you do need to make the decision ahead of time. You're actually choosing, are you taking world history at the regular level, or are you going to take world history at the honors level? Um, the same thing when it comes to US history. Because there's a summer reading assignment. And so if you're going to do it at the honors level, you <coughs> need to know ahead of time that you're doing that in order to complete the summer reading assignment. In grade 11, you can take regular world history too, or we have another advanced placement offering in European history. That's a two semester class. Um, it's the second semester of AP Euro that covers the content of world history too. So you need to take both semesters in order to get through the world history two requirement. And in grade 12, our social studies class is government. You can take it at the regular level or you can take an AP class. Events, psychology, American Valley Humanities, Economics, and a senior seminar. So that those don't um, supplant taking the required classes. They supplement. It's the person who really loves history and wants to take more. Um, there are additional offerings and electives in social studies. Science. Um, all freshmen will take science and technology. That is the MCAS test that we will be giving in science. They will take the ninth grade year. They then don't have to take three MCAS tests at the same time. Uh, they get their science MCAS done freshman year. Um, English and math have to be taken currently in sophomore year. Those are, those are year tests, not course tests. <coughs> Students who love science may want to do both biology and science you don't have to take both. On the perverse side of that math sheet, there are science paths. For people that really want to be able to get to these AP classes and multiple AP classes in science at the end, they're going to want to double up because they're going to want to get some of these prerequisites done before soft by the end of sophomore year so that when they can start to take AP classes junior and senior year, they've got the prerequisites out of the way. Um, so if you want to be able to take an AP class in science junior year and an AP class in science senior year, you're going to want to double up freshman year, take biology and science and technology so that by the time you get to sophomore year you can fit in chemistry, you may want to do an elective like anatomy and physiology or your physics class because remember four year colleges typically want you to take in physics. And then that would leave space in your schedule to do AP classes. Now, we don't run all four science AP classes every year. We run them on a rotating basis. For a small school, we couldn't fill them if we ran all four every year. So for instance, this coming year, we've said to juniors, you're going to be able to choose between AP chemistry and AP environmental science next year. This year, we ran AP biology and AP physics, and the plan is to rotate those every two years. Um, if your child doesn't like science, again, they just have to take the science and technology freshman year. They can take biology sophomore year. They can take chemistry junior year. And then they can take one elective in the sciences senior year and never take an AP class and fulfill the science requirement. Or they can do some path or combination in the middle. Um, but the requirement is four classes in science, these three being required in at least one elective. But then the ability with the planning and the four year sequencing of taking some of the AP. And Ms. Yoma has going to pick it up in additional requirements. Pre 
pretty self-explanatory on this slide. We've already mentioned the world language requirement is the same for Frontier that it actually is for the state colleges and universities in Massachusetts, which is three years of the same language. And here at Frontier, we offer French, Latin, or Spanish. Um, five credits which equates to two courses, typically help one as a freshman and help two as a sophomore. Um, I, I'm not that concerned that they get it in as a freshman and sophomore. Some have <coughs> stretch it out to junior and even senior year. Um, but we do try to kind of get that done if we can. Um, it often runs opposite their phys ed class. So on alternating days they have phys ed and opposite that. You know. um, art, as Ms. Allen mentioned, um, that has to happen one course over the four-year span. Um, it can be the any kind of the music, it can be the visual art, wood shop, anything like that um, is a graduation for art. Um, the program of studies, we don't have um, published for you, but it is available online, so if you do want to see what the other here we have a hard copy of the Media Center and in the guidance office, but this is available online so you can see what the other offers are. Oh, this is my favorite part. <laughs> this looks so, if you look at that, who would even know what to do with that? I'm going to show you in a second what it really translates to um, and what the students, this is actually what your student will get um, in the mail in August. Um, and it looks very confusing, but it's really not that bad. You just have the course title, the course number, which doesn't really mean a whole lot to anybody but us. Um, the semester, S1 indicates semester one, fall, which runs September through mid-January, semester two, mid-January to June. Time, as you know, we're running on a block schedule, A, B, C, D. Um, B1 denotes um, an odd day, B2 an even day, room number, and the amount of credits. Teacher. So then we can go here, and this is kind of a much more simplistic way to figure out where you're going in semester one and semester two. But this is designed to be a pretty typical freshman schedule. I think we have a second example of showing those. So here we have somebody with a math course and a history and a biology. So three main classes in the fall. And then there are three main classes um, in the spring, side tech, Latin, and English. We do try our best to balance, um, particularly having um, a history and an English if possible in different semesters, so we're not putting all the writing demands in the same semester. Um, this side tech class is going to be in the spring because, again, that's closest to the MCAS time in early June. Um, so there is lots of thought behind this. Um, what I didn't talk about is this block here. So you see it's B1, and we've talked about how B1 is odd days. So B block, this student um, on an odd day goes to strings on an even day goes to help and just rotates. But they're still going to these classes every day. Each class is 86 minutes, even these. Um, and then mid-January switches to this schedule over here. Those classes rotate like different times of the day that they meet, or do they have like geometry X every morning at 8 o'clock? Oh, it, it, yeah, it's not too much on it. It's a lot to remember. The schedule is confusing, but it does rotate in that one more way. So again, on an even day of the week, so what's today? It's our second. So they started their day with geometry. Tomorrow, D block would be first. They'd start the day with biology. That's really, those are the only two rotations, the B and the C remain the same, but the other, I guess the other thing is you have to know B1 and B2, and it's not But that's... Are there some guidelines on like expected time to finish, like to get honors class, or to be class, to make sure you go out to the class, you have to figure out how much you can manage and sports are playing. I would say the teacher, for the most part, is going to put that out there. Um, it used to be there was some sort of formula around um, minutes for every grade. So if you were a junior in ninth grade, 90 minutes, so an hour and a half more in a day, that 
that would be for all your stuff. That's just something I read because the rule of thumb somewhere. So it's not that so for the AP classes, which they would sign up for, one of the reasons why they have to have the signature of the AP teacher is so that they have that discussion. That's one of the things that teachers talk about is what are the work expectations, what's the workload. Um, the other course that they need to commit to ahead of time is, is in social studies in ninth and 10th grade. Are they going to take it at the regular honors level? And um, for U.S. history, Mr. Tebbets meets with the students once schedules are somewhat set in June before students leave. Anybody that's requested honors level, for instance, U.S. history, he meets with them to give the summer assignment. And at that time, he also talks about expectations. So that if people want to change their mind, they're, you know, they're able to do that. Um, the guidance counselors work five days after school ends and we come back five days before school begins. Um, your schedule is mailed home um, the end of the second week, beginning of the third week in August, so you get it before we're back for those five days so that, you know, say you didn't do the summer assignment and you decided it was going to be too much work. You can contact us to, to make schedule changes um, based on those things. And we can do that, you know, before we leave in June as well. If you as you're talking about, you know, to teachers about the expectations, if it's too much. One thing I will say is, in my experience as a eighth grade counselor, is that for the most part, I would say in almost 95% of cases, we're going to try to build a schedule like this. It's rare that we would have four major classes on one semester. That's a lot. That's even a lot. There are some upperclassmen that choose to do that, but they're still in the minority. So for the most part, when we say balance, we really want it to be three major courses and then electives to just give you a little bit of a break. And it also has <coughs> access, if you try to manipulate the schedule to do something outside of what's been suggested, <coughs> that also can create that overload. You know what, I want English with so-and-so this year, well then all of a sudden that could, and then we say, well, well now my schedule's uneven. Well, we're a small school, we can set it, but once you start to step in and say you want certain things or take things out of order, Let's say you wanted a, an additional art class freshman year because you're really into the arts. That could make one get one semester heavier than the other. If that makes sense. So as soon as you put in, you know, outside additional decisions outside the normal, kind of especially freshman sophomore year, um, that, that happens. Because you get it's kind of like it's very similar to college. We you push a lot of the um, requirements freshman and sophomore year. And then junior and senior, they have a lot more elective space and a lot more choice. And we do that on purpose as we're building the college resumes, making sure they get everything they need early on. But I, all the counselors, we always encourage the students to ask. Sometimes they, they do want to move something for whatever the reason, and they're, they don't know the thinking or what is going on behind the scenes. And sometimes all it takes is for me to say, oh, I can't do that because that class is full. And they're like, okay. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. And so we encourage that because they don't always know. Okay, here's another one. So the, what's different about this one is this student is on an individualized educational program and they have a skills lab or a structured study hall on their schedule. And EOD just meets every other day, so again on alternating days. So if we look at it in this format, um, this student has two main subjects in the fall, and their first two blocks are um, essentially elective courses outside of their required skills lab, uh, which supports their main classes. But again, same idea. Uh, they would rotate business and marketing and programming and game design every other day, as they would his ed in their skills lab. And then C and D, they, French and the world history they would have every day. Semester two, they have three main classes and they still maintain their skills level. So that's again just to illustrate those who have students on IEPs that that might be the way your schedule works. Um, and, that, and that IEP will dictate how much skills lab they have. And there are students that will have a complete B block skills lab so they have it every single day. All the things on their need and what their IEP says. Yeah, it's so just we a sample, that. right? And yep. there are kids who have need more needs in math and more needs in writing, so we adjust based on that as well. So I think we're pretty 
pretty much to the end of what we have to present to you. Does anybody have any additional questions? I have a question regarding the honors level students and who decides if it's appropriate for a student to take that class. Are you saying that's the advisor's decision? Um, we, we're leaving it to the teacher, at least as far as English is concerned. So when the student arrives in the English class, the English teacher um, informs the students as to what would be the requirements to be an honors student. And the student has that week side. Um, the teacher is encouraging them to talk with their parents and counselors and whoever can help them come to that decision. And then at the end of that week, the student lets the teacher know if they're going to attempt to be in the honors section and then the, they we're told to kind of schedule them there. Um, history is treated a little differently. They have to make the decision ahead of time because it's a whole separate class. So there's not a prescribed um, prerequisite to get into those honors classes, but there are recommendations made um, by the teacher. So may I ask one more question? So at this point, students are already assigned their advisors, and they should know who that person is, and they're helping them with their schedules. I'm the, I'm the advisor. You're the advisors for the ninth grade class. Uh, for this current eighth grade. Okay, got as it. As they move into ninth grade, I will be doing their schedule with input from um, the math teacher. And you've already started that process yeah, with the students? That, I'm glad that you raised that point because they all got the yellow sheet before February break. So they have it. They've had it. And that was done on purpose so they would have a good amount of time. Now granted that may be lost by now since they've been to another state. Um, <laughs> but you can take ex use what you have here. You can take extras. Um, I'm asking them to have it in by this Friday, knowing we were going to have this meeting today. Um, if, again, like, like I said before, if you need um, more information from me about where their math placement is, um, if you need extra time. The thing with ninth grade is there's not a whole lot of choice, as you can see. It's pretty prescribed. They're all taking, they're all taking English, they're all taking history, they're all taking a math, and they're all taking science. So math is really the major area to kind of out. So talk with your student because even though they might not tell you, tell you they don't know, they do know because they've had the conversation with their teacher. I, I get it, I have an eighth grader myself. So, um, I, I know, just, uh, and just for clarity though, you are, you're not in a vacuum making the decision whether or not a child is going to be in an honors yeah, class or not. Yeah. That's made by the child, okay, by the parent who's going to sign off on those things. And then also, you're kind of the person who gathers all the teacher information to apply it to the paper. Yeah. So if you have a, you know, for, for this next year coming up, if you want your child to take honors um, uh, world history, let's say, so yeah, you simply are, check that off or contact her. If it doesn't show up on that, call her to make the correction. Yeah, you are yeah, that's asked up, that's to up sign to off on that sheet. I don't know if you saw here. And we don't deny, let's say your child is taking, you know, is an eighth grader now, and is failing, you know, eighth grade history. If they want to take honors next year, we're going to say, that's not a good idea. I really want to take it. You have the right. Okay, we don't say you cannot. Um, the only point where we, we, we say you can't is courses that build on one another, such as math. If you didn't pass the course prior to it, you can't, go, you know, it's... That's fun and drive. Something. For math and language, the prerequisite not really any bargain there. It's just, it is what it is there. Um, so, yeah, sign off on the student's form if it's lost. Um, you can download another one from our website. Um, there's some notes on the website about due dates, and if anybody has a student who's thinking about applying to Franklin County Technical School, there's information about that as well. Their counselor's coming to visit with us next Friday, March 11th. And that's a mandated part of that application process. Um, so, uh, back to your question about the English, that is the English teacher, social studies. Yeah, English is slightly different. They're making that decision. Essentially, they could make it without a parent knowing. And what they, because the idea what the English department wanted to do is they wanted to meet the students and get them to challenge themselves. 
that was the idea. They wanted a different approach rather than signing up for a year in advance. They wanted me to say, this is what we're going to study. This is the books we're going to be doing. They're right there on the spot. They say, hey, you know what? Go ahead and try it. You know, you know, get the first week to see what it's like. They wanted to kind of draw them in that way rather than kind of pre-prescribe what those classes were going to be. And those classes are different. Um, the freshman and sophomore classes with English, this, this honors kind of extension within the classroom. Um, it's a new thing to try in order to get it's, it's, to raise the first year. Yeah. And I would say um, I had uh, a student come to me just last week about wanting to now go back to regular level. And so we work with that case by case. It's not the end of the world. I'm just sitting here. That sounds like, oh, and we'll try to work with it. So this honors English, will they stay with the same uh, teacher if they decide to go to honors? Yeah, it's in the happens within the same classroom as the regular college prep. Okay, so they have to do extra work. They have to extra sizes. Okay. Anything else on schedule? Okay. There are a couple of additional things I want to mention, and they don't apply to ninth grade, but I think it's important that you know about them as a possibility for the future. We've talked about the AP classes and sort of that for your planning. We currently have 11 AP courses in our program of study, nine of which are offered each year. That's an awful lot of AP classes, um, which is great, but again, you can see that you need to plan that in. A couple of other things that we have for juniors um, in, uh, in seniors, one is virtual high school. Um, so they are, we are a small school. We don't have every elective in the world. We don't have Irish literature. We don't have, you know, women's literature. We don't have specific courses on subject. But there may be a class that your child wants to take that Frontier doesn't <coughs> offer that we can offer them through virtual high school, which is an online course. Um, so it could be taught by someone in uh, Minnesota. They are in the library, the librarian supervises them. It gives them the opportunity to take specialized classes um, as electives, not to supplant our own courses, but that they might want to do um, for electives. And they are eligible to begin those junior year. They can do those junior and senior year. The other thing that a few students do every um, senior year, um, we have students that want to do dual enrollment. Um, they want to go to college and have that credit come back on their high school transcript. Now, simply because of location, the vast majority of our students who do it, do it at Greenfield Community College, but we have had have students go down to Holyoke, we have had students do um, UMass, we have had students do Smith. So if the college offers it and they can handle the logistics, you know, getting there, um, all of that, negotiating that whole thing, um, as long as they have a 3.0, as they enter senior year, they can be considered for dual enrollment. Um, so that that's something just to keep in mind, again, not applicable for next year, but I'd like you to sort of have a, an idea of the breadth of opportunities that they'll have in the next four years. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that in addition to all of the scheduling that we're talking about, um, there's another major role, well, there are two. One is personal, social, emotional uh, counseling that we do with students. But in terms of planning, and that's for the college and career search. Um, we tend um, to really leave ninth graders alone until we talk about 10th grade scheduling. It's enough for them to get used to high school. Um, but beginning sophomore year, we really start focusing, um, as strange as this sounds, on thinking about the future. And we work with sophomores. Um, we encourage them to take the PSATs, which are the preliminary scholastic aptitude tests, the pre-SATs because those practice tests give them an idea of how they might do on those college entrance exams, and they can do those both um, sophomore year and junior year. Um, we do career interest inventories with um, our sophomores, uh, where they go through an online system to see what they might be interested in um, career-wise. That's actually the second time they do that. They also do a module with Ms. Zioma and they are, um, as eighth graders. Um, but they'll repeat it in high school with a little bit more knowledge. And we have them do that because we hope it informs their course selection as they begin to have more elective opportunities. 
Um, in junior year, um, in spring, spring being early February, um, for us spring, um, we meet with all juniors about the college um, search and the timeline for that. Um, and we begin the process in detail of what they need to do before the end of junior year, what they need to do over the summer, and then what will happen when they come back in the fall. We then meet with them again in September to go over where they go from there. Um, and so that's sort of the other piece of uh, our roles um, in, in terms of guidance counselors, and we encourage you as that unfolds to ask us questions as well. Yes. Does, does Frontier offer the college financial planning So we, yes, we bring in um, someone from MEPA, which is the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, and we typically do that in November um, to speak specifically about the FAFSA, uh, because you can actually file it beginning January 1st, so um, we do that annually, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, not formal classes like Kaplan or uh, Princeton Review, but um, typically um, once a year, um, Ms. Mitchell, our Director of Secondary Education, will have an English teacher do a two-week session um, and a math teacher do a two-week session on the structure and do some practice exam. It's not a full-fledged prep class, but they do an introduction to the content and structure. Any other questions about anything that we've covered tonight? Yes. That, essay, that math and um, English time um, you put the SATs, when is that done? Junior year? That we typically encourage them to do that in, during junior year. Is yes. It soft? Is it spring or um, um, fall semester? Um, she typically does that fall semester. And it, because it's not too late for seniors to do it, um, but most applicable for juniors because they're going to take it for the first time in the spring. Any other questions? The, the language require the language requirement. It was Latin. One of those you would need like Latin one, Latin two, and that. So whatever language they take, whether it's Spanish, French, or Latin, they need to take two years in the same language. They can't take Spanish one and French one or, or right. Latin one. They, they need to do two consecutive years at a minimum. Full years or so half years? So for us, a semester. year is a semester. semester. So Sorry. they could take one in the fall <laughs> yes. and one in the spring, yes. and then yes. it's done. Two, 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 yeah, blocks, or whatever yes. you call it, a semester. Yes. So. Of course, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? We know this is a lot of information, um, and you're probably in overload right now. As I said at the beginning, please contact us with any questions. Um, we're more than happy to take your calls, and we'll be up here.